Hello, everyone, and welcome. Our 2022 Ask the Expert podcast series is sponsored in part by Alexion AstraZeneca Rare Disease, Genentech, and Horizon Therapeutics. Alexion AstraZeneca Rare Disease is a global biopharmaceutical company focused on serving patients with severe and rare disorders through the innovation, development, and commercialization of life-transforming therapeutic products. Their goal is to deliver medical breakthroughs where none currently exist, and they are committed to ensuring that patient perspective and community engagement is always at the forefront of their work. Founded more than 40 years ago, Genentech is a leading biotechnology company that discovers, develops, manufactures, and commercializes medicines to treat patients with serious and life-threatening medical conditions. The company, a member of the Roche Group, has headquarters in South San Francisco, California. For additional information about the company, please visit gene.com. Horizon is focused on the discovery, development, and commercialization of medicines that address critical needs for people impacted by rare autoimmune and severe inflammatory diseases. They apply scientific expertise and courage to bring clinically meaningful therapies to patients. Horizon believes science and compassion must work together to transform lives. This podcast is entitled The Future of Diagnosing Transverse Myelitis. My name is Gigi DeFibri, and I will be moderating this podcast. SRNA is a nonprofit that's focused on support, education, and research of rare neuroimmune disorders, and you can learn more about us on our website at wearesrna.org. For today's podcast, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Blackburn, Clardy, Flanagan, Greenberg, Levy, and Pardo. Um, Dr. Blackburn is a former James T. Lubin Fellow and Assistant Professor in the Department of Neurology at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Clardy is an Associate Professor and Neurologist in the Division of Neuroimmunology, within the Department of Neurology at the University of Utah. Dr. Flanagan is a professor of neurology and consultant in the Departments of Neurology and Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at the Mayo Clinic. Um, Dr. Greenberg, who should be joining us is soon is a neurologist and the director of the Neurosciences Clinical Research Center at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Levy is, is an associate professor of neurology at Massachusetts General Hospital and research director of the Division of Neuroimmunology and Neuroinfectious Disease. And Dr. Pardo is Professor of Neurology and Pathology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. So welcome and thank you all for joining us today. I'm very excited about this discussion, um, talking a bit about the history of uh, diagnosing transverse myelitis, kind of what we've learned um, since then and where we're, we're going in terms of um, diagnosing transverse myelitis and, and what that means. Um, so to start, Dr. Pardo, uh, do you mind just talking about the history of what what we know as transverse myelitis. Um, when was it first described? And then how was, you know, I know it was the Transverse Myelitis Center um, at Hopkins at one point now, the name is the Myelitis and Myelopathy Center. Um, how was that started at Hopkins? Uh, thanks so much, Gigi, for the invitation to the podcast. And thank you for our colleagues around the country for joining the meeting. Uh, uh, transverse myelitis actually uh, is uh, quite a fascinating, interesting term. And uh, historically, it has been used particularly in the 20th century after uh, uh, the late uh, 40s, and the term transfer myelitis was coined uh, in a paper that was published in 1948 in Lancet that described the, uh, the presence of a, a myelopathic syndrome that emerged abruptly in a patient with a pneumonia. Uh, and the terminology has been used in on and off or was used on and off in the 50s, 60s, but later after uh, the 70s, actually the term became basically the, 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 the magic diagnosis for anybody with uh, spinal cord disorders. And most of the literature, if everybody has interest in going back to the, take a look of uh, transfer myelitis, actually many papers emerged in the 70s, 80s, and, and after that, a lot of papers in the 90s uh, using the terminology transfer myelitis. Uh, I believe that our uh, colleagues in the past uh, century actually coined the term transfer because many of the patients that had infectious disorder that evolved uh, uh, to experience uh, myelopathic syndromes actually had a very dramatic and fulminant spinal cord disorder. Uh, that involve uh, dysfunction in the motor uh, uh, sensory pathways and autonomic dysfunction. And it was very equivalent in many ways to what it was observed in patients with uh, spinal cord injury or traumatic injury. 
But interestingly, uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, uh, the British neurologists actually uh, already had coined the term infectious uh, uh, myelitis. And early in the century, with the upsurge of many viruses that happened in the first part of the 20th century, actually uh, many clinicians uh, coined the terminology infectious myelitis. And even at Hopkins back during the first part of the 20th century, one of our uh, former uh, pediatric uh, pioneers of the pediatric neurology, Frank Ford, described beautifully in his books, uh, uh, all of the cases of infectious associated myelopathies uh, associated with measles and other type of viral disorders of the period. So it is mostly uh, a terminology that was linked in some way to infection and viral infections. And, and it's very interesting because even now in our clinical practice, every time that we cross with patients with uh, uh, transverse myelitis in quotes, actually the first thing that we think about is viruses. But interestingly, as many of you have done, actually uh, myelopathies are no longer uh, transverse myelitis. It's basically an spectrum of very diverse uh, 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 pathologies, including autoimmune-associated uh, uh, inflammatory myelopathies or other type of uh, 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 viral-associated myelopathies that produce devastating spinal cord disease. Uh, back at the end of the 20th century in 1999, when we established the first transfer myelitis center around the country, actually we used the term transfer myelitis because that is exactly what we learned in our residency training, that there were patients with transfer myelitis. But very soon after we start basically our experience in, in our center, we discovered that there was a wide spectrum of disorders that were associated with inflammatory myelopathies, acute inflammatory uh, uh, myelopathies. And the major revolution of, of, of the myelopathy world happened in the first five years of the 21st century when our colleagues at the Mayo Clinic described aquaporin-4 as being an, a, a, an antibody that triggered a, a myelopathic syndrome. And this was basically what has been the, the, the revolution understanding myelopathies. And as we know right now, uh, uh, the diversity in etiological factors contributing to uh, inflammatory myelopathies is quite uh, uh, broad. And that is one of the reasons we uh, decided two years ago and say that we need to stop. We need to uh, basically uh, stop using the term transfer myelitis. And we are encouraging all our colleagues, residents, to stop using the term transfer myelitis. And uh, several years ago, when uh, Maureen Milley was working with us, actually, uh, she presented for the first time a very extensive casuistic of patients, over 500 patients in the American Academy of Neurology, in which she described that uh, many of our patients with transfer myelitis actually were patients with a very diverse uh, uh, group of disorders, including patients that had been misdiagnosed with transfer myelitis and really had other pathologies like vascular pathologies, like strokes of the spinal cord. Up to the present, uh, what we know is that actually the term transfer myelitis, we put together what we have seen in our experience over almost uh, 1,200 uh, uh, patients. Actually, 35% of the patients that are labeled transfer myelitis do not have transfer myelitis or myelitis. They have an, another type of disorder like uh, a stroke of the spinal cord or dura levi fistula or other things like that. And I think that that observation is similar to what our colleagues in uh, Utah, like Stacy or, or Jan in the Mayo Clinic have published already in which they see uh, a quite diversity of etiological factors contributing to uh, the terminology transfer myelitis. So I think that my, I, I like to conclude that I have been uh, staying in the past several years, we need to get rid of this term because we are mistreating patients. Patients are getting, treatment that they don't need to have when we give the diagnosis of transfer myelitis. And we need to encourage our colleagues in the neurology community to modify the diagnosis and, and focus mostly on etiological diagnosis rather than using the term transfer myelitis. So I will stop here. Um, I'd love to hear from my colleagues about the topic. Yeah, I don't know if, any, if anyone else wants to comment kind of on that, uh, the, any of the history or kind of um, the terminology being used um, at this time. 
I, I agree completely. I, I think, um, you know, the term transverse suggests that it's all the way across the cord, but we have inflammatory myelopathies that can evolve just a part of the cord. So it kind of, I think it causes confusion for people. And, uh, you know, Dr. Pardo's group has collected so many cases and shown the diversity that using a different term will help, you know, people get to the right diagnosis. So I think it's, it's bad if you start off with a term that doesn't fit very well, then it can lead down the wrong track. Um, and I guess to, to follow up Dr. Flanagan, how has this kind of diagnostic process changed since the discoveries of the, of the antibodies mock and aquaporin 4 um, in terms of kind of differentiating different types of, of uh, myelopathies? Yeah, I think it's just been a, it's been a great success story, really, um, the two antibodies uh, discovered um, that really can give a name to the condition for these patients who previously were told they had, you know, idiopathic, or we don't know the cause, cryptogenic, we don't know, maybe it was a virus, maybe it was something else. And now we can tell them the exact disease they have and what we need to do about it. And now, you know, in, in the case of aquaporin-4 antibodies, you know, if you make the diagnosis, we will often recommend, we will generally in all patients recommend long-term treatment. So, this can prevent them from having further disability. And these patients used to really have severe issues. And we now have three FDA approved medications for these patients. So this can be life-saving for patients. And for the MOG antibody, you know, um, it's a little bit different in that some patients will still only have one episode or other patients will go on to have recurrent episodes. But at least we can tell them what to look out for. Lots of those patients go on to develop um, optic neuritis. The other thing to mention is we looked before, you know, just to see what proportion, and we found about 10 to 20% of cases of transverse myelitis uh, when we went back and tested them that were labeled as idiopathic, we were able to discover. So it, it accounts for a reasonable proportion of these cases and very important for patient care. Great, thank you. Um, and so uh, Dr. Levy, I know you've also conducted some research kind of into potential genetic causes of, of transverse myelitis. How does this research kind of change our understanding or help our understanding of uh, this diagnosis? Well, we had the opportunity to evaluate two sisters who both had an idiopathic transverse myelitis. And we took advantage of a collaboration between Baylor College of Medicine and Johns Hopkins to sequence all the genes in these two sisters, as well as three healthy siblings. And we found a genetic mutation in the two sisters that we didn't think was, would really be involved in an inflammatory condition like transverse myelitis. But as it turns out, this, these genes might, um, might be involved in um, uh, how proteins are packaged um, for the immune system to recognize them within the spinal cord. And so we're looking into this. We have a great fellow coming in next year to start this summer. who's gonna look into how these proteins are involved in transverse myelitis when, when we didn't really suspect it at all. And that just goes to show you that even though genetic causes of transverse myelitis might make up a, a very small minority, I think we found a total of eight out of hundreds that we've surveyed. Um, it just goes to show you that we can still learn a lot about these few few patients and maybe extrapolate that and try to understand how the disease occurs at all. And, and maybe those processes are also involved in patients who don't have uh, genetic causes of transverse myelitis. So stay tuned for, uh, for updates on this research uh, next year. Great, thank you. Um, and Dr. Clardy, I know you recently also published a study looking at um, transverse myelitis in the VA health system. And so I was just wondering if you could comment on how this paper, the findings kind of maybe changed our understanding of how common um, this diagnosis is or that how, you know, what, what this paper kind of contributed to the um, understanding this diagnosis. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and all thanks to, to the foundation for supporting this. Two of our fellows <laughs> uh, actually worked on this project a great deal. We, um, we set out to do this and perhaps underestimated uh, the number of veterans in the whole entire national system that would have uh, this diagnosis or, or rather it was considered for them. So we sifted really through um, 
close to 5,000 charts by hand. <laughs> Kudos to Michael Sweeney and uh, Jonathan Galley. Um, I don't think we quite knew what we were getting into ahead of time, but but so glad that we did it. And and I think we confirmed a lot of what we've already talked about today. You know, um, and it, Hopkins and and Mayo had previously put out um, some research about what myelopathy looked like when it came to a quaternary referral center. And in a way, what we were doing was sort of in reverse verifying. Um, what they found, you know, uh, much of what they found in those papers and, and, and Carlos and, and, and Owen could probably speak to this was, you know, that of the cases that ended up at a quaternary referral center, several had not even had cerebral spinal fluid analysis. And in fact, we, we found the same thing um, in looking at this large national cohort. Um, so, so it highlighted to me, we have a lot of work to do is the bottom line on the neurology side in educating our colleagues. Um, if we're considering this diagnosis seriously and not even looking at spinal fluid, we're already sort of, um, you know, <laughs> kind of making it difficult to get the accurate cause or the accurate diagnosis. Um, to your, back to your question too, you know, the original um, reason we wanted to do this was when I was digging around in the literature and went all the way really back to the NIH and INDS website, looking anywhere for how common is this condition I couldn't really find anything. There was a brochure that cited a reference that was about 30 years old and I couldn't really tell how accurate that might be. So we really did wanna get a feel for that. Um, and, and it's perhaps more common, I think, than we thought, at least based on the literature. I don't think anybody on this phone call was surprised, but we found about eight cases per 100,000 by, by prevalence. Um, and we hesitated to go more into sort of incidents because it, it gets a bit complicated, especially with the large time period over which we were following. We followed the, the, these veterans in the, in the study. They were seen at the VA an average of 12 years. So it was really, a, I think, a good look, um, but definitely highlighted to me that we've got a lot of work left to do. Um, it, you know, many of them also didn't have what, what I think many on this, this call would consider an accurate treatment trial either. Um, and, and they had a high level of disability, right? Um, we measure that in many of our retrospective studies by something called the modified Rankin score. It's a scale from zero to five, but, but many of them uh, were coming out at around a three. Um, and, and I think we would all agree, we, we would hope we could do much better than that in the modern era. Um, but again, this was a longitudinal study. And um, so really just sort of put some numbers to, to the sense and the hunch that we all had. Um, and really laid down, um, I think, the, the sort of the framework for where we need to go to improve. Great, thank you. Um, and Dr. Greenberg, um, there were criteria that were published up for TM in 2002. How has our diagnostic process kind of changed in the past 20 years? I can't believe 2002 was 20 years ago, but yes. I'm having a hard time but believing that as well. Um, and so a lot has changed. I mean, when we think about the fact that uh, in 2002, we didn't have the anti aquaporin 4 antibody test. We didn't have the anti-MOG antibody test. There was a complete lack of systematic analysis looking for uh, vascular lesions of the spinal cord um, and a lack of awareness around certain patterns for neurosarcoidosis uh, presenting with myelopathy. I mean, it's really um, eons ago from a discovery perspective. And so with the recognition of all of these uh, causes of myelopathy and myelitis, uh, we've been able to differentiate among our patients who used to carry the, the name transverse myelitis as a diagnosis and really work them down into subgroups. One of the things that's interesting, for example, if you look at the anti-MOG antibody-associated disorders, um, individuals with those illnesses can have relapses separated by years or more than a decade if they are having relapses. And so in a paper uh, talking about idiopathic transverse myelitis, we would be thrilled to talk about five-year follow-up in cohorts. Well, that's nothing when we're talking about an anti-MOG associated disorder. And so people who we were, had labeled as idiopathic may have subsequently gone on to have a relapse and we wouldn't have known it. And so as we chip away at the molecular biology and the work Mike's done on genetics and looking for atypical myelopathies, the world of idiopathic transverse myelitis is getting smaller and smaller, which is a good thing. 
Uh, I used to joke in lectures, some people have heard me say idiopathic means the doctor is an idiot and pathetic for not being able to find the cause, idiopathic. And as we're getting better at what we do, the number of people left without an answer as to why is getting smaller. And so it's really changed our approach to diagnosis. We are looking to do angiography in more patients than we used to. We're looking to send a broader systemic workup for autoimmune disease than we used to. And we're being cautious with the labels that we provide to folks. Um, Kyle Blackburn had uh, led a paper uh, talking about dropping the word transverse from the name, that it's, it's probably time we redid the nomenclature and really just talked about myelitis. And because the notion of transverse myelitis being a standalone diagnosis has confused many people for many years. And I think we're getting to a place now where we can finally clean up the language so we do a better job of communicating to our patients what they have and hopefully why they have it. Great, thank you. Um, and then Dr. Pardo, I know you uh, talked a little bit about kind of potential vascular causes of myelopathies. I know that you published a paper, um, I guess a couple of years ago at this point now, um, but how did this, um, what you found in terms of uh, the vascular causes of myelopathies, how does that kind of change our perspective on diagnosing uh, transverse myelitis or um, other forms of myelopathy? Uh, so the observations uh, that we have on uh, vascular myelopathies, both acute and chronic, are, are based on the observation that many patients refer to our center with the diagnosis of transverse myelitis end up having either strokes of the spinal cord or chronic evolving vascular lesions associated with dura levi fistulas. And uh, there have been a couple of publications, particularly on the chronic evolving uh, pathology, and we have submitted some uh, other uh, papers for analyzing what is going on with, with those patients that are diagnosed uh, uh, by mis misdiagnosis with uh, strokes and, 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 and treated as transfer myelitis. The, the, the bottom line is that overall, based on what we have seen, and I believe uh, uh, and Dr. Flanagan uh, has uh, stated in, in other publications, similar observation is that approximately uh, between 10 and 20% and, and of patients with the diagnosed transmyelitis, actually they have vascular myelopathies. And uh, the main message is, it's extremely important that our colleagues in the community identify those patients. Because unfortunately, what we have observed is that many of those patients during the acute phase actually undergo treatments as, in quotes, transfer myelitis, and they go on IV methylprednisolone, plasma exchange, uh, 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 even uh, aggressive treatment with immunosuppressant medication when they have just strokes of the spinal cord. Uh, and that is a, a, a very difficult situation because actually uh, we are worsening the clinical situation of many of those patients by doing that. So I think that the emphasis that we are, uh, 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 we are uh, uh, doing now is make sure that the diagnosis during the acute phase is correct. And there are several aspects of the clinical assessment that give basically good sources of information. Patients that during the acute phase have normal spinal fluid, this is a flag to say, wait a minute, is this really inflammatory? Is this really myelitis? Is it really associated with an autoimmune inflammatory disorder? So there are several aspects of the clinical assessment and the approach in the diagnosis of the patient that is telling us that those patients need to be evaluated carefully and those patients probably don't have inflammatory myelopathy. The same happened with the MRI. The assessment of the MRI, a magnetic resonance imaging of the spinal cord is becoming a, a very good tool. And we are now identifying several patterns that allow us a better uh, diagnosis of vascular myelopathic syndrome. So. I think that the clinician in the community uh, uh, need to be educated and need to be uh, uh, aware that strokes happen in the spinal cord, that strokes happen in children uh, and strokes happen in adults, and uh, that the 
clinical profile is, is uh, very different to the typical profile of patients with demyelinating uh, uh, myelopathies or autoimmune associated uh, uh, myelopathies. So that is what we may need to emphasize and perhaps the work that uh, the group has been doing the past several years trying to modify the, the diagnostic criteria is going to be extremely beneficial. We need to get rid of the transmers as uh, Dr. Greenberg stated. Uh, that is a misnomer, uh, and that is misleading the management of, of many of our patients. Great. Um, yeah, so to transition, I guess, uh, Dr. Blackburn, I know you, um, Dr. Greenberg said that you worked on the paper about kind of removing that word in the beginning. Um, so do you mind just talking a bit about that and also maybe how, um, during your time as a resident and then fellow, how um, stuff is, the diagnostic process has kind of changed um, over time? Absolutely. So... Um, I guess the first thing is, I think as everyone is saying, there's a little bit of a movement kind of internally to drop the term transverse from transverse myelitis. And I think we've, there's a, a case being made now that we have a better understanding of specific etiologies that we can do that and feel more comfortable uh, in doing that. Um, since I've been a resident and a fellow, um, we have, there's been really a lot of work done that has uh, been done by a lot of the people in this call, actually, that has influenced how we approach these cases. So probably one of the first things that I would emphasize is just how we've started looking at our imaging in more, in more detail and, and using what we see on imaging to actually guide our thought process early on in, in the diagnostic process. Um, so now in today's world, I actually have residents, uh, whenever they contact us about a case, they're often giving me ideas about etiology based on what they're seeing on imaging. And I think 15, 20 years ago, it was really, does this look like multiple sclerosis? No, I think this is transverse myelitis and that's as far as we got. And that's a really exciting change. Uh, of course, during my time in training, the MOG antibody became widely available. And certainly that has helped um, elucidate uh, some cases that would have been labeled as idiopathic. And then uh, I'll also say, um, I came of age during the rise of AFM kind of in 2014 and 2016. So I um, saw all of the, this new cause of myelopathy uh, predominantly in children rise. So that's how the landscape has changed over the last about six years. Great, so thank you all. And I'm gonna open this up kind of to everyone, you know, whoever wants to respond. Um, so there's been discussions kind of about changing the terminology we use. Um, using kind of different diagnostic tools in maybe different ways, or um, you know, obviously having new testing like the antibody testing. Um, so what kind of changes do you foresee to potential diagnostic criteria in the process that someone um, would undergo to get to this diagnosis? Yeah, you know, I think we're gonna see hopefully several things. I think everybody on this call is committed to and, and aware of efforts to bring together the community to formally update the diagnostic criteria, and um, I'd love to see that happen in this year and, and come out and um, fill in some of the holes from the, the old criteria uh, that have just evolved as, as we have evolved. But also, I think one of the critical things is independent of the final buckets that patients get assigned, the final titles, is the workup and the evaluation. And I think as a field, what we really want to see happen is patients getting the appropriate workups at the time of presentation um, and not having to travel to specialty centers to fill in gaps. Um, I think we have seen the widespread adoption of testing with the anti aquaporin 4 antibody, which I think was a major step forward for the field of neuroimmunology, multiple sclerosis, transverse myelitis, neuromyelitis optica. I think we're seeing a similar spread of testing with the anti-MOG antibody. But what we haven't yet seen, at least I haven't yet seen, is widespread skills at referring patients for angiography appropriately, and then also appropriate angiographies being done. I think we still see a lot of patients for whom there is a high suspicion for a vascular event and perhaps inadequate vascular studies being performed to the spinal cord. And unfortunately, that test isn't just a lab test um, and is much more complicated to do and is user dependent. And it really speaks to the need for us to engage collaboratively uh, 
with our uh, colleagues in interventional neuroradiology and get them comfortable with doing more of these exams and doing them in a complete fashion. So I, I think there's work to do on the semantics, work to do on the categorizations, but also work to do on raising awareness on how to manage patients in real time. So th that's a, a, a very good point. And I think that one of the uh, important uh, steps in the next several months is to make sure that there is a good implementation and of a very good algorithm and approach to evaluate patients with acute myelopathic syndromes, acute and subacute chronic myelopathic syndrome. So I think that uh, identify the right diagnosis is identify the right etiology. And we are not able to treat correctly a patient with an acute myelopathy if we don't identify correctly the etiology. Treating NMO is very different to treat a demyelinating myelopathy. Treating NMO is different to treat a patient with MOG. So I'd like to emphasize that uh, we need to educate the community about what are the different steps as Dr. Greenberg outlined very well. Uh, there are very, uh, clear steps that are easy to be done. Uh, the great thing that we have in the past several years is to have access to the immunological assays for diagnosis. One of the major limitations is the lack of access to good imaging of the vascular supply uh, to the spinal cord. I, I really am staying away now to say that we need to have angiograms or everybody that we we are diagnosing with vascular myelopathy because the reality is number one, it's difficult to be performed uh, in every center. And number two, there are a lot of technical dif difficulties. And number three, remember the blood supply, the vascular system is very dynamic. So two or three days after the stroke, the blood vessel may be recanalized. We are no longer able to see the occlusion or other factors may influence the outcome of that test. So I think that we need to be very practical and we need to outline the different uh, aspects of what we are going to do acutely with patients and how we are going to manage and what is the type of test that we need to uh, acquire for establishing the right diagnosis. I, I can make a quick comment just to say, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Pardo has published extensively on a, a few things that can be really useful clues that we don't even need a test for, which is the age of the patient, the sex of the patient, and um, the time from the onset of symptoms to the maximal deficit. And if you use those three, you're gonna you know, get close to the right answer a lot of the time. So I think, I think there's a lot of uh, confusion out there where patients um, have a slow gradual progression and have more of a chronic course and that doesn't fit well with a lot of myelitis. So I think when the criteria come, it'll need to stratify the cases from a, a very sudden onset to kind of an acute subacute and then a more chronic. And that can really help in uh, distinguishing the different uh, causes. Gigi, can I make the a counter argument against getting rid of transverse? My, my sense is that most doctors have heard of transverse myelitis. And if we take away that term, I'm afraid that we're going to deprive them of an opportunity to refer patients to us. And while we can go through the algorithm and order angiograms and figure out patterns on MRI that might predict one type of myelitis from another, I'm worried if we get rid of the term transverse myelitis, it's going to disrupt the whole community of referrals that come in. And trans, I mean, remember even the former name of the Siegel Red Neuroimmune D uh, Disease Association was Transverse Myelitis Association because that's how they come in. And if we want to, if if we want to improve on the semantics, we can expand it. We can call it Transverse Myelitis Spectrum Disorder, or you know, or something like that. But I don't think we necessarily need to get rid of the term externally. We just need to get better at defining it internally. That's my argument. I'm not as worried as Mike. I, I think the world can adjust and, and move forward. We, we used to call some of these things Landry's paralysis and Hopkins syndrome, and now we call it AFM. The, the, the world moves on. I, I think your point's well taken. And um, I know we get a lot of questions um, about treatments and management of, of patients and sometimes discussions 
around semantics and names can be dry, but I'll just point out that if heterogeneous patients are lumped together, then research around therapies and cures is dramatically hindered because we'll never understand why one treatment worked for patient A and not patient B if they had the same, quote, diagnosis. And so being exact in the words we use to describe patients is mission critical for getting like groups of patients together in order to identify the best therapeutic interventions for those patients. Before there were ST elevation and myocardial infarctions, heart attacks, and non-ST elevation myocardial infarctions, it didn't make sense why some treatments worked in some and not the others. And so categorization is, is sometimes boring and has risk. And Mike, I think you're right that there is a, a downside to changing names, but I, I do think it's important to for the field to overall advance so we can get better treatments. Agreed. And yeah, I mean, I think obviously discussing the semantics or the terminology used is important to then get these kind of diagnostic buckets to then be able to have treatments and, you know, potentially restorative things, uh, you know, for the diagnosis. So uh, Dr. Clardy, were you going to say something? So you unmuted. You know, no, I think we could, we could go around. I agree. They're going to find you, uh, Dr. Levy, um, you know, especially because most of the referrals come from colleagues. Um, and, and what I teach my fellows is you have to earn the term transverse myelitis by working first through the differential from myelopathy, right? You have to prove that it's inflammatory, um, which is what the itis at the end there sort of implies. Um, but yeah, um, I, I think anytime someone sees one of these lesions in the spinal cord amongst our colleagues that is not in this field, I think they, they, they find us very quickly um, to try to, in most cases, to try to help out and, and sort an answer. Um, and so I guess my question as um, someone who has been diagnosed with, you know, idiopathic transverse myelitis, um, and there are many people that I know who, who have been, what would this kind of change in terminology or um, change in this mean with is the goal to kind of not have that category exist anymore? Um, is it, you know, what, what does all of this kind of entail for someone's day-to-day -day life or how they get treatments or um, that sort of thing? I'm just curious. So I'm going to jump on answering that question because actually that related with one of the questions in the chat that is the issue is, yes, the issue is semantic and categories and that will allow us to predict what is going to happen in the future. Uh, we recognize easily now that patients with neuromyelitis optica actually frequently develop bad in very difficult uh, intractable pain. And that actually is extremely important because we can identify patients that prospectively can, we can be uh, more focused in treating potential bad outcomes. And the same happened with uh, strokes of the spinal cord. If we identify correctly a vascular, acute vascular myelopathy, we can identify risk factors that, may, that led to that vascular myelopathy and trying to modify those risk factors so we can actually help the patients to modify the risk factors and prevent other potential problems. And the same in, in the situation between demyelinating disease of the spinal cord. Remember when we were diagnosing uh, NMO, uh, we initially treat patients with uh, interferon uh, treatment, those patients uh, worsened. So identifying correctly the category, if this is NMO, uh, we know that we, are, we need to be a stay away of interferons and we have better treatments now uh, that are going to, benef to be very beneficial for potential outcomes in the future. So that's the benefit of including a very precise diagnosis at the beginning of the myelopathic syndrome. We are going to end up with the group idiopathic myelopathies as well, idiopathic uh, uh, myelitis. We are going to end up, but as was mentioned by uh, Dr. Greenberg, eventually those patients will turn out to be NMO later or MOC later. So, but we need to be raise a better level of awareness among uh, uh, clinicians to say, okay, you need to be alert to have this diagnosis and establish a better diagnosis and treatment in the future. Yeah, any other comments? 
I will say I always think there's going to be a role for an idiopathic category, at least in the very near future in these disorders. Um, there, I think everyone here has seen a patient that despite all the testing, the, the etiology still remains unclear. And it, and it may be that um, something happened that was would have been acutely apparent had we done a, a certain test at that moment when it was going on, but um, that, that time has passed. Uh, now they're seeing us a few years down the road. So I still think there will be a, a label uh, of some sort for idiopathic or cryptogenic, whatever your preferred term is. It, it just may be, um, it'll certainly be a smaller proportion of patients with a new group of criteria that meet that uh, definition. Um, and I think it may be worded differently than it is in the current criteria. And I think it's important to remember, you know, I know there's some mention about cure in the chat, but sometimes the best cure is, you know, immediately in guiding our treatment. You know, if this, if, if a patient has an aquaporin-4 antibody uh, positivity, for example, and a myelitis, we're really going to be using plasma exchange in the vast majority of those patients. So it can really be important and that can be where, you know, we can really prevent the disability. So it can be, uh, it can be really crucial in terms of patient outcomes. Um, so we've talked a bit about um, the, diff, you know, the idiopathic transverse myelitis or disease associated um, myelitis. So what, what are, what do these terms kind of mean? And what about kind of vascular versus inflammatory? How do we differentiate between these two um, during the diagnostic process? Yeah, I, I think in terms of the, the second part first, in terms of identifying vascular, it's first having a level of suspicion based on the history. Um, despite all of our technologies, all of our blood-based tests, it's still important for a healthcare provider to take a careful history from patients and to look for any of the red flags that would lead somebody to be concerned about a vascular event of the spinal cord. And it's important to recognize there are lots of different types of vascular events of the spinal cord. So sometimes an artery that feeds the cord can be blocked, leading to a lack of blood flow. Sometimes it's a vein that's draining the, the spinal cord that's blocked. And sometimes people have an abnormal connection between arteries and veins called a fistula that can lead to funny pressures in the cord. And each of these can present slightly differently. Some of them can present with a rapid evolution of symptoms with where somebody goes from perfectly normal to profoundly disabled in under six hours. And whenever we hear that history, I think everybody on the, the call would agree that should be a red flag to look for blood flow issues related to the cord. Likewise, when we hear about recurrent events, as particularly in older populations with back pain, and when the MRI doesn't exactly fit for a classic inflammatory lesion, we should look for these dural AV fistulas. Um, a lot of these are missed and people are told they have recurrent myelitis when in fact they have an intrinsic problem with blood flow to the cord. And then this is the really frustrating part. Once you have a suspicion that there's a blood flow problem to the cord, you have to work with an appropriately skilled neurointerventional radiologist to do the diagnostic studies on angiogram in order to see if there's an abnormality. And so I think we have a long way to go to raising awareness about what some of the red flags of these uh, conditions are. Um, Carlos has done a, a lot of work over the last several years looking back at the history of patients who have gone to the Johns Hopkins Transverse Myelitis Center, where in retrospect, uh, on careful review of their charts, um, while they may have come in with a diagnosis of transverse myelitis, the most likely etiology was vascular. And I think it's fair to say, Carlos, that a lot of those uh, decisions are based on the history that the patient told you um, and, and sometimes are often supported by some atypical MRI findings. But that first step is really how the patient tells their story. That's correct, and, uh, and actually that is one of the emphasis that we are giving to our uh, residents and fellows now is talking with the patients and listening the patient very carefully at the evolution of the symptoms, establishing the temporal profile of the symptoms and the characteristic of the symptoms are very key 
for uh, uh, the diagnosis and the right diagnosis. But I'd like to move a little bit on the future. And, and actually, uh, we encounter all of these patients that get tons of exam, tons of blood testing, including NMO, MOC, and other antibodies, and we find nothing. And I, I really think that uh, what uh, Michael, Dr. Liu is doing uh, with the genetic part of the myelopathic uh, syndrome is very important and it's going to be very important for the future, particularly because uh, as we are seeing now in demyelinating disorders of the brain and in many other neuroimmunological disorders, this is a group, a subset of those patients that actually we are able now to identify better to have polymorphism in the genes, gene modifications that lead to very rare variations of immunological responses that are giving demyelinating disease, white matter disorders. And we need to have a much better way to explore our patients with idiopathic myelitis, because I guarantee that some of those patients actually uh, fit in the group of patients in which there are genetic variations that are influencing the development of these myelopathic syndrome. So but I think that we need to pay attention to that in the future and dedicate more effort to understand the host, to, uh, to understand what the genetic uh, susceptibility that patients may have for developing uh, spinal cord disorders that are not necessarily uh, exclusively inflammatory. It may be actually metabolic disturbances that damage the myelin and other sort of uh, uh, abnormalities that eventually will give us a better explanation for those idiopathic myelopathy. Thank you, Dr. Liu. I think I saw Dr. Clary, I don't know if you had any comments about the vascular, I saw you unmute at one point. Very observant. You know, I was just gonna say, I think it, I think it was maybe, oh, was it Carlos's paper? I'm not sure which one, right? But, but I think the most powerful thing that's easy for sort of the non-neuroimmunologists to remember is the time. And, and it is, you can get that in a, in a five minute history. When did you have your first onset of symptoms? And at what point did it drop to the worst level? you know, when were you the most severe? Um, just did that this week in clinic. Actually, Ben, it was a, a patient I think you had sent over our way and, and sure enough, the answer was 12 hours. And so that patient is going, going for a spinal angio this week um, because, you know, a very, you know, it, it just right there. That was it, question done. We were sort of had the plan after the answer to that question um, in terms of hinting at a really uh, vascular cause. The other thing to mention just about some of the, the, the fistulas, you know, are, are treatable. So it's really, really important not to miss a dural arteria venous fistula because the problem is, is once the damage is done in the spinal cord, it's quite difficult to reverse it for some of these conditions. So the earlier we can detect it, the better. And we've all seen patients where it's taken too long and then they struggle, um, you know, so it's really disappointing to see that. So I think um, we have to remember, particularly that one that we can fix quite readily with our neurosurgeons or with um, a certain radiology techniques. I think that in the chat, there is a very interesting question is for patient that has been diagnosed many years ago, like 20 years ago, if it's worth it to go back and reanalyze the situation and, and change diagnosis. So it will be interesting to give an opinion about that too. So. Uh, to clarify that question. The other that, few sorry, that raises in my mind the question about cures and long-term outcomes and people who have attacks years ago and are, and are at this point now and they're wondering, well, what does my future look like? What, what kind of cures are you working on? What kind of remyelination or recovery regeneration therapy are you working on? I wonder if this audience, if this panel thinks that it matters which diagnosis you have in terms of what you'll respond to, or if spinal cord injury five years after the, an attack, whether it's vascular or NMO or whatever, it, if it was a you know damage done, can those can all of those people potentially benefit from some sort of restorative or remyelination therapy? Are you leading leading the uh, witness there, Dr. Levy? 
I I'm just curious, do, you know, do, is this is this a type of recovery therapy that we're going to have to put into bins? Uh, uh, restorative therapy for NMO, recovery therapy, MOG patients recover well on their own. They may not need any, but idiopathic TM, vascular, is each category going to have its own stem cell trial? Or do they share some common pathology that maybe they can all respond to? What does everyone think the future looks like for these people that I see the questions in the chat about cures and recovery? I'm just yeah, curious my, what everyone here thinks. Michael, I think it's a great question. And, and I think the answer is in the end, there will be therapies that definitely cross over regardless of the cause. The goal with the, the restorative therapies we're working on is whether your spinal cord was damaged by idiopathic transverse myelitis or anti-MOG associated transverse myelitis to have a therapy to help both. But the clinical trials to get those therapies approved will have to be done in homogenous patient populations. I'll, I'll give you an example. Our, our current stem cell trial for transverse myelitis, and we, we hope to have our uh, first patient in the operating room in, in March or April, um, excludes individuals with the anti-aquaporin-4 antibody. And the reason for this is a technical one. One of the concerns we have when we put stem cells into the spinal cord is they could elicit an immune response and cause new myelitis, like in an organ, rejecting an organ in an organ transplant. So our patients are going to be immunosuppressed to prevent that event. But in the course of a trial, if we enrolled a person with the anti aquaporin 4 antibody and during the course of follow-up, they had a new myelitis, it would be very difficult to tell the difference between an enema relapse versus a response to the transplanted cells. So from a clinical trial design perspective, I think the trials will be done in individual patient populations to control for some of these issues. But once we have therapies that work, I think we would apply them across the spectrum of spinal cord patients. I think there was a question in the chat about the COVID vaccine, uh, but, and maybe it's topical to cover that. You know, in general, I, I think even for patients who ha had myelitis triggered by a different vaccine, the COVID vaccine is quite different. And I think we've been recommending it in all our patients. You know, we've actually seen a lot more problems with patients developing inflammation secondary to the infection than versus uh, secondary to the vaccine. So I think, you know, we strongly recommend the COVID vaccine and, and try to have all our patients boosted, particularly those on immunosuppressants where that might put them at a bit of higher risk. Great, thank you for responding to that. Um, so we just have a few minutes left. I was hoping you could all kind of give some final thoughts and, you know, as SRNA, you know, we plan to kind of continue this conversation um, and engage more with kind of the broader medical community as well to improve the diagnosis of myelitis and myelopathy, which will, as we've talked about, you know, impact treatments and prognosis um, and potentially, you know, a cure in, in the future. So um, I guess I just like to open it up and see if um, anyone has any final thoughts uh, to share. I can give a quick final thought. I'll just say, um, you know, I think, um, the future uh, looks good. We've made a lot of advances over the last uh, 20 years. And I think a lot of those advances have been based on patients giving research samples and helping us discover these things. And we really appreciate, you know, all the things that patients have given us that have allowed us to learn about these diseases and how to treat them. So uh, it's really a thank you. And I think we're making good progress. And, you know, we're all here together. And we're, we want to work together to kind of fix this. So I think there's a, there's a real effort out there to try and focus on myelitis and, and treatments and helping patients. I agree 100% with those statements. And it's extremely important that patients and family keep the focus on the future. And uh, again, there are a lot of frustrations. And I, every week we experience that frustration, the frustration that you have with chronic pain or chronic weakness or spasticity is the same frustration that we have not being able to treat correctly or improving that situation. So I think that in the near future, uh, 
we need to pay more attention to improve the quality of life, particularly pain. I think pain is a nightmare. Uh, we have a lot of medication for pain. We have been, been successfully treating patients for that pain. And I think that the effort from many institutions, NIH and other, other uh, uh, institutions that are funding research should focus in helping us to get better treatment uh, for pain management in patients with myelitis and myelopathies in general. Great, thank you. I think advocacy is a big thing and advocating for yourself. Obviously you have some people on this call who are, who are quite passionate um, about trying to, to you know, move the needle forward in this condition. But you know, with, with the, you know, the internet now, um, I think you know, coming prepared, to sort of ask the hard questions to your docs. Um, I think we like that. I think we value that. Every time I can tell that a patient has put some thought into things, um, it, you know, it, it really helps to make a difference. So, you know, because sometimes we do just get caught all up in symptom management. And so if that's not what's on your mind, you know, and if your mind is let's look more for why did this happen or let's look more for uh, rehabilitation and creative avenues there, I think really just saying, you know, your top priorities every time for the visit and, and advocating that way um, really helps to move things forward to get the most out of, you know, what, what, what's currently available we have to offer. You know, even saying, I have some patients that say, I wanna be first on the list the second a trial comes for X, right? We, we remember that. So, so really um, don't underestimate the impact you have on your physician when you come in with a pointed list of goals. Um, and keep doing that because because it is the patients that are moving this forward. Yeah, and if I can just shortly dovetail on, on Stacy's comment about advocacy, self advocacy is so important, and then community wide advocacy also important. And um, the SRNA through programs like this, I think, does a wonderful job of keeping community connected. But I, I do want to put out a plea to everyone listening. As you get those emails from the SRNA with surveys or registries, and it takes so much time to get your records together and put in data, it, it is time that is well spent. The information that's gathered by those types of survey studies where we're asking you the community questions is really important because we all, all the different specialists on this call only get one small sliver of a view of the community based on whoever comes to our clinic. And it is so important for us to understand the community at large as a whole internationally. And so if I had to put a, a plea out there, it'd be to take the time when you can to answer those surveys because the data is actually very meaningful. Great, thank you. And then um, Dr. Blackburn, you want to Sure, so um, I think the whole, to kind of wrap everything up, uh, the whole, discussion today is around make, uh, changing how we think about these things by defining potentially a new nomenclature. And I do think that's really important. Um, I think that that's going to lead people in the very early phases of the disease to identify the right diagnosis earlier, apply the appropriate treatment to minimize damage in the acute phase, which is critical identify people that are at high risk of relapse to prevent that from happening. And then of course we focus on by, by identifying these things in more and more fine tooth ways, the ways to help recovery. So I, I think this is just the first step in a long succession of work to come. Great, and Dr. Levy? Uh, I just am excited about the opportunity to, um, to do research in this area. And I think that um, we're going to continue to carve up the classification of transverse myelitis into smaller groups of homogenous patient groups. And then we'll be able to do good research on uh, treatment for all of them. So stay tuned. Great. Well, thank you all so much uh, for chatting with me and also responding to um, the comments. I really appreciate that as well. Um, you're all wonderful. So thank you so much. And we look forward to continuing this conversation. And yeah, well, thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.